Pancake everyone, curious viewers. Modern history knows an endless number of examples of genocide. But what are the motives behind such crimes and what happens to the guilty parties in the end? Let's talk about this in today's episode. What marks the beginning of the long terror in Cambodia? And what factors can we see? It all starts in 1968, when a radical leftist communist movement appears in Cambodia. Maoist ideology and the goal of creating an absolutely communist state were formed over seven years and gathered around 30,000 people, most of whom hadn't even reached adulthood and came from families with immoral behavior. The future terror was led by three people, Pol Pot, Yan Seri and Yuan Chia, who were leaders of the Communist Party of Kampucha. Even back then, their activities showed a dislike for foreigners and a lack of understanding of the people. The government was full of repression and citizen deportations. Some things were done openly in front of the people, but most of the ideological ideas were hidden from the curious eyes. Pol Pot, the Prime Minister of Cambodia, considered himself as a student of Stalin and formed his political activities based on his works. This is the man who will leave his bloody dictatorial name in the history of the Khmer Rouge. Let's examine what this social movement is and what principles it adhered to. The Khmer Rouge is an unofficial name for a communist movement with an agrarian focus that originated in Cambodia in 1951. They gradually became more active within the country, and their main symbol was a red flag with a sickle and hammer, or an image of the Angkor Wat temple, which was one of the country's main holy sites. For a long time, it was impossible to know the eternal structure of the organization as they carefully hid their activities. They attempted a revolutionary experiment consisting of two main points. The first was barracks communism, which involved depriving people of all rights and freedoms and using them solely as a workforce, without any allowances. This was often expressed through the enormous bureaucratization of public relations. Any moral norms and requirements for improving life were also erased. The second point was agrarian socialism, which was a slightly more lenient system, but focused on the free use of land by the authorities, rather than on the construction of production facilities. All of this was despotic intentions that would have led the collapse of society and the economy, but the followers of this idea didn't see it that way. Although, the elimination of commodity money relations would have resulted in colossal resistance from society. However, they had a solution for that too – aggression and murder. The question at hand is, what were the main goals of the group's participants and what methods did they choose to achieve them? The goal was the genocide of the population based on Western characteristics. It sounds confusing, but the Khmer Rouge aimed to eliminate Cambodia's dependence on Western countries. They also planned to liberate peasants from corruption and debt with interest rates. It seemed like the most benevolent intentions of political leaders, caring for their citizens and making senior efforts to improve their standard of living. But this devilish triad is concluded by the last item, the establishment of a harsh political regime headed by Pol Pot, an idealistic head of state. The methods were brutal. People were forcibly evicted from cities to villages, religion was persecuted and strictly prohibited, officials and former politicians were heartlessly killed. People were divided into three categories – the main population, the new population, and the intelligentsia. The first group underwent re-education since this group had long been unoccupied territory under the authority of the United States and were considered to be oriented towards Western ideals. The second group became slaves for similar reasons and were subjected to torture. The intelligentsia was more complex. It included the clergy, army and government officials, as well as revisionists. They were subjected to a so-called purge, which consisted of the total extermination of dissenters and those unwilling to submit to the new authority. People were required to work, often for 14-hour workdays, and the work were forced labor. There was a complete absence of healthcare, education and scientific system. Children were sent to concentration camps, where attempts were made to instill a love for Pol Pot's rule. Young teenagers were recruited into the Khmer Rouge army, they were given weapons and almost all local power remained in their hands. They patrolled the streets, supervised work on rice plantations, brutally tortured and killed people. The death penalty was introduced for the slightest offensive. Giving birth to a child without the commune's permission, nostalgia for the previous regime and spoiled crops – all of this meant execution. Ethnic groups were also subjected to genocide. Chinese, Vietnamese and certain Cham peoples were exterminated, including their families and even children. One day, the regime ceased to be an idea and became a reality. On April 17, 1975, the Khmer Rouge overthrew the government of Cambodia and established a dictatorship. A revolutionary experiment was declared, and the state of Cambodia was renamed Democratic Kampucha. Already in the first days, people realized that they were facing hell on earth. 
doctors, teachers and priests were destroyed. Anyone who wore glasses, read books, knew a foreign language or wore European-style clothing was considered an intellectual threat and such people were killed. Writing and reading were forbidden, and children weren't allowed to receive an education. Forms of politeness were also abolished, and literary words were replaced with slang. From 1975 to January 1979, all 60,000 Christians were killed. Churches and mosques were looted, most were blown up or turned into pigsties. One of the survivors of the genocide described these actions as follows. The population of the village of Srisim was almost completely destroyed. Soldiers herded children, tied them in chains, pushed them into water-filled pits and buried them alive. People were driven to the edge of the trench, hit on the back of the head with a shovel or hoe and pushed down. When so many people were to be eliminated, they were gathered into groups of several dozen, wired up, subjected to an electric shock from a generator and then pushed unconscious people into a pit and buried them with earth. Even his own wounded soldiers, Paul Pot ordered to kill so as not to spend money on medicine. In four years of rule, 1.7 to 3 million people were killed, which is a third of Cambodia's population. How did other countries view the antics of a neighbor that affected the world economy and violated the United Nations Charter? Democratic Kampucha was almost completely isolated from the outside world, with full diplomatic contacts only maintained with China, Albania and North Korea, and partial contacts with Romania and France. Meanwhile, China, the only country maintaining close ties with the Pol Pot regime, watched with irritation as events unfolded. By this time, Vietnam had definitively reoriented its foreign policy towards the Soviet Union, with whom China continued to maintain extremely tense relations. On February 17, 1979, the Chinese army invaded Vietnam. The war was fierce and short-lived, with hostilities ending by mid-March. For a long time, the United States saw no problem. No hunger, no economic problems and no terror. Vietnam, with support of some other states, began actively fighting Pol Pot and his brutal abuses of the people. As a result, they were able to overthrow the regime and remove the Khmer Rouge from power. The entire modern world supported this intervention, but China remained dissatisfied, having lost of support in Pol Pot. In 1982, the coalition government of Democratic Kampuchea was formed in exile, representing Cambodia in the United Nations and other international organizations. What awaited the criminals after the collapse of the organization and the overthrow of power? From 1995 to 1996, a number of Khmer Rouge fighters deserted the group, with 18,000 living. In 1996, the organization surrendered in the central part of the country. On July 15, 1979, the People's Revolutionary Tribunal was established to investigate the genocide crimes. Two months later, on August 19, the tribunal found Pol Pot and Yen Seri guilty of genocide crimes and sentenced them to death in absentia, confiscating all their property. Moreover, the tribunal also charged the Chinese government with support and inspiring the Khmer Rouge political regime. During the trial, a member of the United States Supreme Court bar, Stephen, said, Chinese leaders should sit in the dock as accomplices in the crime, along with Pol Pot and Yan Seri. Until the end, Pol Pot denied his guilt in the deaths of millions of people, as did his followers who tried to portray themselves as innocent, claiming that they didn't know how many people were killed in reality. There is no document left in history with Pol Pot's signature, so he said, I was responsible for everything, so the blame lies with me. But comrade, show me at least one document proving that I personally was responsible for these deaths. Most of the Khmer Rouge were punished by the court or tribunal, while Pol Pot officially died before any action could be taken against him, supposedly due to the heart failure. But later it was revealed that it was likely poisoning or a successful attempt to end his life. Years pass, but in the memory of art, everything remains eternal. After trials, executions, confrontations and punishments of the guilty, a trace of eternity always remains, recorded on different media by completely different people. In 1984, an Anglo-French director created the film The Killing Fields based on real events. The main character is a correspondent for the New York Times, who stays in Cambodia during the reign of the Khmer Rouge and covers the situation from the epicenter of events. In 1985, the film won three Academy Awards and eight British Academy Film Awards. One of the well-known hardcore punk bands, The Dead Kennedys, released the single Holiday in Cambodia, in which they sing. It's time to taste what you must fear, right guard won't help you here. Brace yourself, my dear. In Phnom Penh, the capital of Cambodia, there is a museum dedicated to the genocide. Previously, during the reign of Khmer Rouge, it was Tuol Slang Prison. 
Here, you can see exhibits that remind us of the barbarism taking place in this country. You can also see evidence that was specially used to report on the torture of prisoners in the prison. This is the only museum in the world where it's officially forbidden to smile, and scenes with crossed out faces studying this emotion are hung everywhere. What's happening in our reality after this crime now? On July 21, 2006, the last commander of the Khmer Rouge, Tamok, died. Nothing is known about the new leadership of the movement. It's believed that after the death of Pol Plot, it finally collapsed, and those who remained alive and didn't fall under the court's hand are sitting in the jungles, engaged in robbery and periodic smuggling. In 2010, Kan Kyu, the head of the secret 12 slang prison, was sentenced to 35 years in the prison. On November 19, 2018, the United Nations Special Tribunal for Cambodia for the first time convicted representatives of the Khmer Rouge regime of genocide. Found guilty of this crime, they were sentenced to life imprisonment. According to the verdict, 92-year-old Nguyen Chia and 87-year-old Hugh Samphan are guilty of the genocide of Vietnamese and Cham people living in the country. For these two, this life sentence is far from the first. They received their initial sentence in 2014 for crimes against humanity. What impression did this episode from the dark corner of history make on you? Share your opinion in the comments and tell us how the tragedy could have been prevented. Don't forget to give a like for the effort and see ya in the next release. Bye.